Good afternoon, everyone. Thank you for being here. Everybody, uh, we come together this morning to celebrate the life of Steve Hurd, a man that definitely knew what it was like to fight the good fight, to run the good race, who's now finished his course. And I don't know, uh, when I look around here and I see so many of you in uh, jerseys, you can't tell the players without a program. So, uh, by way of introduction, I'm Scott Richards, I'm the pastor here. But when I was thinking about Steve's home going, the, the thing that hit my mind and my heart was uh, that classic scene of someone uh, crossing home plate after they score the winning run and they get mobbed by their teammates and there's that celebration. I don't know if when Steve crossed the line into heaven, when he stepped on that ultimate home plate, 
if there was a mob of angels and already perfected saints ready to do that same kind of welcome. But it wouldn't surprise me a bit. Well, let's open up this time in a word of prayer. Father, we thank you for Steve's life. And we thank you, God, for that race well run and that fight well fought and that, that uh, glorious crown of life that you've bestowed upon our faithful brother. Lord, uh, we thank you that uh, this is a celebration of the beautiful work that he's done and the fact that he has passed the baton of faith not only to his children and to his grandchildren, but Lord uh, has made such an impact on all those who knew him. So Father, we welcome your presence here at this time. We would ask, Lord, through the presence of your Holy Spirit to bring a little bit of heaven down here for us that we might be able to share that perspective of the fact that we are just warming up in the bullpen as far as when the road game begins. And thank you, Lord, for Steve being safely home with you. We commit this time to you. We thank you for your presence. We pray your comfort, especially for Ev and those closest to Steve, in a really wonderful way would be accomplished here among us today. Thank you for this in Jesus' name. Amen. My name is Bryce Hurd, and I'm the son of Steve, and um, I, uh, I'm a minister in England and come here to try to lead the service. So I probably won't make it through, so my friend Rick Nehrud here is a pastor in St. George. Uh, he's going to probably take over for me if I, if I need to. But we wanted to just thank you so much for coming out today to celebrate his life. Um, I've already heard too many stories, but I want to hear more about all that he has meant to you. There are many who are joining with us from around the country and the world. A group of his family and friends are in Iowa at his childhood church. They're joining with us. A shout out to all of you. Uh, there's family and friends joining on, online from Washington and Oklahoma, Utah, Arkansas, Wisconsin, Italy, and England, as well as other locations. Uh, we'd just like to thank you for spending this time with us and celebrating his life. I'm not supposed to cry because it is a celebration of the goodness that he was, but it's difficult. Dad was a guy who liked to have fun and didn't take life too seriously. My brother Corey and I are wearing uh, one of his favorite beloved teams. I got the good one. <laughs> He's wearing Arizona. So. <laughs> We're doing this because we wanted to honor him and his the fun and, and just the joy he shared. And many of you are here wearing softball jerseys as well, celebrating one of his passions that he had. And we just want to say thank you for doing that. We want to try to summarize a great life with laughter and honesty. And I look forward to hearing more of your stories from your interactions with him. But today we're going to start with uh, just a tribute or, a, a, I guess, a summary of his life that my daughter Olivia is going to, to read. You have a shortened version in your, in your leaflet if you got one, um, but uh, hopefully Olivia will bring some color uh, to that shortened version. So Olivia, would you like to come and share? Steve and Eugene Hurd were born the second child to Rex and Bernie Hurd in Eldora, Iowa on April 16th, 1947. He grew up in a small town of about 400 people called Steamboat Rock, Iowa, alongside his siblings Rexy, Kathy, and Becky. Health and safety didn't really exist back then, <laughs> which allowed him to have a dangerous but exciting childhood. Um, from getting his teeth knocked out by his older brother at five, driving a tractor when he couldn't reach the pedals, to taking a wrong turn at home in the middle of the night and peeing on his dad's face while he was sleeping at about the age of seven. <laughs> it's amazing that he made it to the eighth year. Um, he was blessed to start a paper, uh, paper round at 12, which also allowed him to start driving a car at the same age. Oh, to live in a small town in the 60s. <laughs> He excelled in several sports, especially basketball and his favorite, baseball and then softball. 
He went on to Ellsworth College to play baseball and tried out for the Chicago White Sox as a pitcher before joining the National Guard. He played on many softball teams in Iowa, St. George, and here in Tucson. It was amazing to see the 74-year-old man try one of his underhanded layups or hit a home run. Um, he met his future wife, Ev Marquardt, <laughs> in a toddler group at Steenbroke Rock. Okay, maybe it wasn't a toddler group, um, but, but they weren't far off toddlers. Uh, Ev's parents moved to Steamboat Rock when he was nine and in ele elementary school. Um, it was love at first sight for Steve. It took a little while before he could wear Ev down. They started to date when they were 14, but then didn't stop, but that didn't stop Steve from being tossed around by love. The frightful moment happened when Ev's family moved so, uh, sorry, <laughs> moved, uh, uh, so her dad could take a pastorate in Mason City, Iowa, when they were about 15. Um, <laughs> love struck. Steve, Steve tried to, take, uh, to keep Ev's attention by bringing one of his family horses called Queenie that Ev loved to Mason City to stable Queenie near her so that Ev could ride her. It was a great idea, but it didn't work. Uh, Steve soon found out that Ev had a crush on another stable boy. A bit rude. Um, <laughs> heartbroken, Steve <laughs> rushed up to Mason City to retrieve Queenie, and that was the end of the couple for years. It wasn't until Steve brought a Marquardt family friend to Ev's graduation that things turned around, uh, turned towards love again, as their eyes met when he stepped out of the car. Ooh, drama. Uh, <laughs> that was it. <laughs> they were together again. There was only one slight problem. Steve wasn't a born-again Christian, and Ev was. At that time, Steve thought that he was a Christian because he's born in America. I'm American, that's my ticket through the pearly gates. <laughs> well, he was wrong. Um, <laughs> after he proposed and Ev denied him, <laughs> because of his lack of commitment to Christ, he left and spoke to his older brother, to her older brother, Daniel. Daniel encouraged him to be born again, um, and Grandpa prayed to receive Jesus as his Savior and Lord, and his life was changed forever for the better. After marrying Ev in 1968, they became such an item that children in their church called each one of them Steve and Ev rather than their, in their individual names. His commitment to love his wife as Christ loved the church lasted almost 50 years of marriage and 60 years of love, during which time the two definitely became one. Um, Steve had many careers throughout his life. He worked as FS delivery ga delivering gas to farmers, worked for a short stint at Boys Training School for Troubled Youths, Hey Culligan Man, motel manager, owned his own janitorial business, and finally ended his career as the handy old man. Um, Steve served in many churches, first by helping plan a new evangelical free church in Iowa Falls as an elder and good friend to Pastor Rick in St. George, Utah. He and Ev even served two six-month stints in Calvin Mansfield, England, renovating and then serving in their coffee shop. Finally, continuing his service here at Calvary Christian Fellowship, Steve was always friendly and welcoming to all who came in and discipled several young people through his and Ev's simple hospitality. His legacy was that he leaves he leaves stretches from Iowa to Utah to Tucson and all the way to England. He lived his life without concern from for um, of prestige, pomp, or renown. He treated everyone as he met mm, sorry he treated everyone he met as friends and lived his life according to uh, according to one Peter three fifteen. But sanctify the Lord God in your hearts, and always be ready to give a defense to everyone who asks you, a reason for the hope that is in you, and with meekness and fear, having a good conscience. Um, he didn't push the gospel on anyone, but lived his life in such a way so that they would ask, whether it was fixing a sink, hitting a home run, losing a game, serving at church, being a friend, an uncle, brother, loving his wife, or being a father and a grandfather, he did as to unto the Lord. Um, he excelled in many areas, but three more than all else, which were the most important to him, which were being a faithful husband for 54 years to Evan Ev, and a father to Corey and Bryce, and a grandfather to Corey and his wife Miranda's son, Ethan and Noah, and Bryce and Bethany's daughter, Molly, Elizabeth, Mia, and Natalia. Um, until March 5th, after doing some of his favorite things, eating steaks with friends, sorry, Michael and Linda, now being replaced at all. Sat down in a chair with his knife and bowed at the feet of Jesus in the next. Um, I know that when he arrived at the gate, he definitely heard, well done, my good, my good and faithful servant. Um, 
But not only does God say that to him by grace, we say that to him by his works. Well done, Grandpa. Thanks, Olivia. We have a, we put together a short uh, video of some pictures of just to explain and go through his life. Um, hope that you'll enjoy them.
some great memories for many to share. Hopefully, uh, we can share them afterwards as we spend some time together. But we have a few people who wanted to say a few things about my my dad and uh, my brother wrote a tribute for him, and his son Noah is going to come and read that uh, for him now. Uh, hello, I'm Noah, and uh, I'm Steve's youngest grandson, and I'll be reading something uh, my dad wrote. You know that saying, they don't like, they don't make them like they used to. Well, that is the best way to describe my dad. We lost the best person I've ever known on Saturday. I'm sure all of you would agree with that statement, and that is what hurts so bad. I didn't start listening to my dad till I was 25, but ever since then, I learned how true the famous saying is, your parents aren't as dumb as you think they are. I learned more about life and what a man should be from him than anyone else on earth. Although I didn't share his faith, I saw a man that believed in the grace of God and looked forward to meeting the Lord in heaven. I watched a man that used that faith to affect people without ever preaching to them or telling them what to believe just because he believed in the message of the Bible. Many people would ask my dad, why are you different? Why don't you swear or drink alcohol? His proud and simple message was that I am a Christian. I have watched him and my mom's faith leave them without fear of dying and look forward to the joy of being with the Lord in heaven without any reservations. In fact, that was our last conversation. I was confused. I didn't understand, and in some ways, I still don't. But I know one thing, and that is, and that is that he is in the place he so looked forward to being and is waiting for my mom and is at peace right now. Although I am beyond sad and in shock right now, I know that my dad is with God in heaven, and I am so lucky to have been his son and spent the last 15 years living near him and spending quality time doing things like playing basketball, golf, trips, special time with him and his grandkids, and spending every holiday together. The biggest compliment I can get is, you were just like your dad. Even just being said in jest, because I don't remember what my mom just told me 20 minutes before, or I have to say what every 30 seconds in a conversation. We love you, Dad, and we all miss you so much. Thank you, Noah. 25? Really? <laughs> the next tribute will be uh, is from my mother, and uh, it'll be read by my daughter uh, Molly. Oh, sorry. Yeah, good to see you. Sorry, my bad. When the best of me.
That was one of the songs that uh, my brother and my mom and my dad were listening to quite a lot over the last few months and uh, really meant a lot to them as they've walked through some, some times together, which has been something my dad has, would love to, has been able to love to do with my brother and my mother. But all these songs were, were something that my, my dad wanted. In fact, he didn't want anybody to say anything. He just wanted music the whole time. So uh, if you don't, if this, you think the song Great Things maybe didn't fit very well, those are the songs that he loved and wanted to, to sing so, because he could see his Savior. So my mother is, is going to have a, a, a tribute now, and uh, Molly is going to read it, and then we're going to sing a song after that, or actually Dave is going to sing a song after that called I Can Only Imagine. So Molly. Back in the 60s, when the teams traveled to basketball games, the boys sat on one side of the school bus and the girls on the other. So Steve and I sat at the back and held hands across the aisle. In, those late, in these later years, we never walked anywhere without holding hands, even going to the grocery store. A neighbor lady said that the last memory of us is when we were past her house, heading out on our morning two-mile walk. I don't know how to walk without him, but I know for a fact that the joy of the Lord is my strength, and he will walk through this with me. Steve and I often discussed our going home to be with the Lord, and he always said that he did not want a parade of people going across the stage blabbing on about him. He just wanted a lot of worship music that he loved so much. As I look back on the last week we had together, I realized that God was preparing me for his homegoing. One powerful example is that last Thursday night, our son Corey came over to watch a podcast with us. The topic was enjoy and trials. Wow, little did we know. Talk about God's timing. Corey questioned whether we really could do that, joy and trials, and whether we really would be in heaven, whether we really would rather be in heaven than here with family. Steve went on to tell him about the anticipation for going home to be with the Lord. <coughs> Yet, of course, sorrow to be leaving family. We all know he can't sing, never could. But he started saying the words to this song. He's not imagining it anymore. He swallowed up in victory, praising our Lord. His greatest concern was that others would come to know Jesus like he did and to join him in praising God together in heaven, dancing before the throne. What it will be like when I walk by your side. I can only imagine my eyes will see when your face is before me. I can only imagine. Oh, you 
Jesus, or in awe of you, be still. Will I stand in your presence? To my knees will I fall? Will I sing hallelujah? Will I be able to speak at all? I can only That song was written by a lead singer from Mercy Me, and he was he was writing it about his father who had gone before him, and uh, he was writing about what he was thinking uh, about his dad in heaven. So, a very a very great song to be singing now. So we can't we can't go through this service without having a, a tribute from one of his softball friends, and uh, so Dan Needy uh, has known him for many many years. And uh, they met on the softball field, and then Dan became an elder in the church with him, and uh, he's going to share a little bit from that side of life. One thing about it, Steve has no say in what we do here today. (laughs) My wife, who I lost last July, didn't want a memorial service. It lasted a little over two hours. Steve Hurd was more than a friend. He was a brother in Christ. We met on the softball field back when we first turned old enough to play senior softball. We called it fat belly softball. (laughs) And for the younger generation, they were the flat belly (laughs) players. And we were fortunate enough to play on a flat belly team as well as a fat belly team. I guess to explain what Steve Hurd was about in softball, you had to know he was a stocky third baseman with a good glove and a cannon for an arm, albeit the cannon sometimes was a bit loose. (laughs) He also was a pole hitter. And there was one particular situation when we were playing and Steve Filed off a ball, filed off another one. The umpire reached into his pouch to grab the third one he had, threw it. It was foul as well, all of them down the third baseline. And that's when some of the verbiage started from the dugout, not theirs, but ours. Hey, Steve, wife's expecting us home at eight. Hey, Steve, that's the reason they paint those lines. Hey, Steve. And on and on it would go. Steve would just do that Iowa farm boy grin that I think meant, I hear you, but you don't have a clue of what you're talking about. (laughs) And after the third one, the umpire went back to the screen. There's a sleeve of balls there, hold, uh, hold eight or ten balls. He grabbed three more, went back again. Finally, he was out of softballs, and somewhere, miraculously, he came out with a softball that was black. You could tell it was soft. The stitches on it were frayed, and he didn't say a word. He just looked at Steve with the thought, what are you going to do with this one, big boy? 
I don't remember what he did, but the game went on. <laughs> but I don't want to talk about softball this afternoon. I want to tell you about a friend who had a lot more to his life than softball or basketball or Iowa Hawkeye whatever or U of A whatever. He had a depth to his personality and to his life. And my wife, to the day she died, said Steve Hurd is the reason that Dan and I came to Christ. It began the first year we played ball, sitting in the dugout. I don't remember the score or the inning or the opponent. But Steve leaned over to me and said, hey, I'd like to invite you to church. And then maybe the next game, it was the same thing. That went on, and my answer would be, yeah, we'll have to do that sometime. I believe it was about three and a half years later when he said, hey, sure like to see you in church. Same answer. And he said, yeah, you've said that before. But he said it in love. And I often wondered why he befriended an arrogant, pompous, ignorant loser like me and then I heard the words of Paul later on it's the love of Christ that compels me he loved me because Christ loved me the other night I was sitting thinking about my friend and I might not get through this but I was thinking about the judgment seat of Christ where all believers go and their life is unfolded, and that which really doesn't have any eternal value is burned away as a shaft, and then that which does, we receive crowns for it. And I thought back to that first time that Steve said to me, hey, why don't you come to church? And I could picture Steve at the feet of Jesus. And Jesus giving him a crown. Steve, do you remember that incident? Were you a little nervous inviting your friend? And then on and on, the crowns began to be piled up beside Steve. For the family, for the children, for the grandchildren, prayers daily for their salvation, for their safety, for wisdom. And for those, and I've been reading some Facebook posts and people pouring out their love for Steve, saying, we were, uh, Steve and Ev were the first ones that invited us to lunch after church. Steve was the first one who came up to me and said, hi, I'm Steve Hurd, welcome. Steve, and on and on, people acknowledging the love that Steve poured out. And I can just picture Steve taking a crown that has been laid and given to him by Jesus and saying, Lord, you deserve this, and laying that crown at the feet of Jesus. And then I could imagine a voice in the back saying, you better hurry up. It's going to take an eternity to get rid of those. <laughs> and I can imagine Steve not looking around, just whispering, I have an eternity. Thank you, Dan. We're going to sing a song called I'll Fly Away. So the words, I think, will come up on the screen, yeah. You heard what Bryce said, that Steve requested these songs, okay? Because <laughs> we do it like this.
nice to have one of those right in the middle, isn't it? To lift our spirits a bit, eh? All right. And it's nice to know that it's true. You know, the last tribute is, is mine. Um, my dad sacrificed a lot to get me to be able to be a missionary in England. And uh, I wanted to give one to him. It's like I'm, I'm not able to get too personal in the tribute to my excellent father. Not because I don't have many, many stories to share about this great man. But I won't be able to finish if I start. We spent countless hours, countless wonderful hours, playing baseball and, and basketball and football together. He would never let us win. He made us beat him. <laughs> and it was great to be able to do that. Corey's never had that experience. <laughs> <laughs> But it was awesome to have a dad like that. But I don't want to focus on those things because I want to focus on the legacy that my dad gave, gave me. And there's one thing I can say without a shadow of a doubt, and that is Steve Hurd was a great man. And I don't have to qualify that with husband or father or brother or uncle or friend or teammate or the handy old man because in whatever capacity you knew him, he was a great man. But what I want to talk about today is what made him a great man. Well, he, he lived by the words of Jesus in Mark chapter 10, verse 42 and 44 to 44. Jesus says, you know that those who are considered rulers over the Gentiles lord it over them and their great ones exercise authority over them. Yet it shall not be so among you. But whoever desires to be great among you shall be your servant. And whoever desires, whoever of you desires to be first shall be slave of all. For even the Son of Man did not come to be served, but to serve, and to give his life a ransom for many. Jesus told us that the way to greatness was be to, by a, being a servant of all. God in human flesh laid down the ultimate example of serving by giving his own life a ransom for many. Dad followed his example and laid down his life for others. Reading that the way to greatness reading that the way that greatness lays a great challenge before us. Yet my dad demonstrated this on a daily basis. And how did he do that? Well, Paul said, But it is written, I has not seen nor ear heard, nor have entered into the heart of man the things which God has prepared for those who love him. But God has revealed them to us through his Spirit. That's in 1 Corinthians chapter 2. When, as Christians, we often think this verse is in relation to heaven. And when I see the grandeur and the glory of the natural world in Switzerland or Italy or Colorado or here in Arizona with the Grand Canyon, or when I ponder the ingenuity of man's creation in the castles and cathedrals or grand houses in Europe of Chatsworth, of Buckingham Palace, of Windsor Castle, many of these we visited together, it doesn't compare with what God has in store for us. This is true. But it, says, but it, it does say God reveals this glory to us by his Spirit. This is how dad lived as a servant. Many of these grand places we'd visited together, he, he really wasn't all that impressed with man's work. He thought they were nice, of course, but he was never really impressed with their grandeur. He had a different focus. He enjoyed going to these places for one reason, and he went with us, his family. If it was up to him, he'd rather be serving his family by fixing our leaky tap. Though I know he couldn't see the glory of heaven that he can see now. He could see something of what God had revealed to him already. As this scripture says, the wonder and glory of God is not found in the external, but the revelation of God himself to us. And then to live according to this revelation. God loves people. Jesus served people. And so my dad did the same. Many of us here have those, many of us have here and those who are joining us from around the country and world have all experienced his love and service. Uh, my church in England sent me a short tribute uh, to demonstrate this, but I can't read it, so Molly's going to come and read it. People at Calvary Mansfield have treasured memories of Steve whenever he and Ev visited. 
He is such a great example to us in many areas. Steve was generous with his time, always willing to go the extra mile to help and support others. Many of us can remember him working week after week on the church's coffee shop, a back-to-the-brick rebuild that transformed a dreary old shopping unit to a bright, inviting, well-functioning coffee shop. His patience with the men who were helping, some of us didn't know a hacksaw from a fretsaw, and his humor is legendary. Once, when someone asked, where was the spirit level, Steve, as quick as a flash, said, well, I bet it's pretty high in here. Steve will be especially remembered for his guidance in walking with the Lord. He was such a great man of God. He would challenge us, warn us of temptations, and encourage a real depth of faith. We remember times of prayer, him praying for us and for family, with such real feeling. Also, at the early men's mornings meeting, Steve's contributions came from a life lived with Jesus at the center and shaped by his word. Steve's smile, his heart, his faith blessed all of us who knew him. We thank God for Steve. That was sent to me this morning uh, by my friends in, in, uh, in England and made me cry for the 437th time. So. <laughs> so why was he a servant of all? Because he had seen something that we cannot see with our eyes or hear with our ears. As this passage in Corinthians had said, God has revealed them to us through his spirit. This is what makes a person live this way. To know that nothing in this life compares with what God has in store for us and what he wants to reveal of himself now. No ocean view, no mountain scene, or grand castle can compare what God has for us. And if you listen, God reveals this to us through his spirit. And when we have this revelation of God in the spirit, then all other rewards pale in comparison to those wonderful words that my dad has heard from God and I strive for. Well done, my good and faithful servant. Well done, Dad. You've finished the race. The only thing that I hate is you beat me there. Again. My dad can now say, I have seen and ear has heard the things which God has prepared for those who love him. I hope this short summary helps you understand what makes my dad tick and be the man you know. Of all the memories, jokes, and experiences that I had with him, this is the legacy that he has left in me. May we see this witness and follow his, this, his Jesus alongside him and hear the words, well done, when we finish our race. Pastor Rick Neyer is going to come share some words. I think well done heard family so far haven't the girls and uh, Bryce done an amazing job and not so bad yourself Dan he's, he's got a little preacher in him uh, <clears throat> so Steve and Ev heard yeah how do we describe how do we describe them? Um, that's not my job uh, today. It's my blessing uh, to share the word with you. If you remember back in his celebration of life that I think Ma, no, Elizabeth read, uh, there was a time when Steve thought that he was born again. He thought he was a Christian, and the definition of Christian, you just need to look at the root word. The root of the word is Christ. And, uh, you know, Steve believed that he was a Christian the same reason I believed I was a Christian. I was born American. I was American. I was born a Catholic, so therefore I was a Catholic. Anybody born a Catholic in here? Anybody? So you just are. When you're born American, you just are. When you're born a Catholic, you just are. You don't, there's no critical thinking about that. I just am, uh, you know. Uh, but remember that conversation 
that was in that celebration of life, he had a conversation with Steve or with Ev's brother Daniel. And um, if you know Steve, no one's going to convince Steve to do anything. Um, Ev can tell him what to do, and most times he'll do it. But besides her, no one's going to convince Steve Hurd to do anything. Does anybody know what I'm talking about? <laughs> That's kind of an interesting response, just a laugh. Too, not too much. but um, So to share the word, um, and I'm honored to do that. Uh, Scott, thank you for allowing me to share the word, the fellowship that God has entrusted you. Stephen Ev found a home here because the word is primary, spirit-filled. Um, worship's not bad. <laughs> it's amazing, Dave. Absolutely amazing. You have skills and gifts, and you're using them for God's glory, just like Steve did. Yeah. And so um, how I got to know Steve and Ev is uh, at that point we were going to a church and we had a home fellowship at our house and um, they invited themselves to a Bible study, which probably, again, doesn't surprise you that they would do that. And again, to just go back to the eulogy, um, kind of like Steve first eyes on Ev, you know, instant love and it took a long time to wear her down. When they came to our house, we instantly fell in love with Ev. Steve took a couple of years, <laughs> you know. Uh, but eventually, we came around. Uh, and then I had the blessing of being the pastor of Calvary Chapel St. George for 22 years and serving the Lord with them in so many ways we don't even have time to talk about, but it was my pleasure. My wife, Jill, is here. It's our pleasure. Uh, Steve and Ev became, um, I don't want to take the term, um, he was a father, he was a father figure to me, um, but uh, I don't put myself in the, in the realm of Bryce and, and Corey and their relationship that they had. Uh, so friend, mentor, uh, he served on our board and provided me with much wisdom. And that's a stupid idea, Rick, uh, when I needed to hear it. Uh, so much appreciated. Uh, Jill and I, we had two children, and they've given us eight grandchildren. Uh, and Steve and Ev were the kids' grandparents for the entire time they lived in St. George. And um, Ricky and Anna always wanted to go to Steve and Ev's house. And um, at one point, my wife's favorite story is that um, they invited our children over for a sleepover at Grandma and Grandpa's, basically. And after a few hours, Jill and I are like, hey, we're getting ripped off. And so Jill's like, grab the sleeping bags and let's go. <laughs> so we showed up at their doors, that knocked on the door and said, can we come in? And they graciously allowed us. And the only other story I'm going to tell before I share the word is, um, it was back a few years and, and Steve had not yet, just like most of us, you know, committed to, I need reading glasses. You remember that battle, right? And those of you who don't, you will. Uh, and you battle, I don't, well, maybe, you know, no, yes, okay, yes, yes. Uh, so we're driving, we're in Las Vegas, we're trying to find something. I don't know what, I'm driving, and Steve's in the passenger, people are following us, and I'm like, and it's before cell phones and Google Map and all that kind of stuff, and and. I'm like, Steve, come on, figure this out. Where are we? He's like, I don't know. I'm looking, I'm looking. He's got the map out. He's like, I'm looking, I'm looking. We stop at a red light. I look over. I'm like, here, let me help you, Steve. <laughs> oh, oh, yeah, that might help. It's a true story. 
So Steve's favorite scripture is on the front of your program, and if you didn't get one, or the gentleman in the back, I stole yours to make other. Um, they also have another, your church secretary here is absolutely amazing also. Uh, she went to make them, so if you didn't get one, and sir, um, get yours back, they'll be there after service. But you know, the, these verses on the front of your bulletin, if you want to look at that or your program, it says, For by grace you have been saved through faith, and that not of yourselves, it is a gift of God, not of works, lest anyone should boast, from Ephesians chapter 2, verses 8 and 9. Uh, I just want to bring that to life, so if you want to open your program... Uh, and look there on the left-hand side. I want to put those the content of that verse that enables us to put our faith in Jesus Christ. It's what Steve did. Uh, so that's the content, but let's put it in context. Paul is writing to a church, a beloved church, that uh, he ministered to a lot in a city called Ephesus. It's uh, it was on the western coast of modern-day Turkey, and now it's inland a little bit, and you can go there. We've, we've been there. and um, So he's writing back to these people who he's spent long time with and worked through a lot and got in some big trouble and all just sharing the gospel. And so he's writing back to them. And in the second chapter of this letter to them, uh, because our Bible, you know, I, I remember, I, I'm supposed to be Mr. Pastor now, but I don't know, Scott, if you can remember back. I didn't know what an Ephesian was. I didn't know what a Thessalonian was. Uh, you know, and some people just go breeze over it. You know, and if, if I held you all the account, you know, what's, a, what's an Ephesian? Uh, Ephesian is just somebody who lived in Ephesus who became a believer in Jesus Christ. Just read the first couple verses of this book. And so, um, you know, there's a bunch of, what do you call your, Tucsonites? Is that a, uh, Tucsonians? Tucsonians? Uh, you know, so this letter, it could be written to the Tucsonians. And... Um, your pastor would probably write this to you if it wasn't already written by Paul. He said, but God, some of our favorite words in the Bible, but God, um, favorite words in my life, favorite words in Steve's life. How many of us, you know, we were headed down the wrong way, down a one way, the wrong way. And, and if it wasn't for but God, uh, we would have crashed into that wall. And Steve and guys like that, make a difference in all. but God who is rich in mercy uh, not just merciful but rich in mercy you know what is, what are you rich in what do you consider yourself rich in ask yourself right now what do you consider yourself rich in I'm like well I don't know I never thought of that well it's a good time to think about it what are you rich in all of these tributes to, to Steve, which he would have hated. Um, he was rich in mercy. He was rich in grace. If, if you want to go to someone who has what you need, you go to someone who's got the most. And God, you know when God, Moses was asked by God to take a bunch of Three, two, three million of people, disobedient, stiff necked like me and Corey and Bryce and others. Like, I won't use any of the ladies' names, but um, like us, and take them up north and bring it. And Mo's like, No, I'm not going. I am not going. Uh uh. Unless you go with us, I'm not going. And in fact, if you go with us, you need to show yourself to me because I'm not moving from here until I know. You're going, and I've seen you. And God said, you can't see my face. You'll die. But I'll do this. I'll put you in a cleft of the rock, and I'll walk by, and I'll move my hand, and you can see the backside of my glory because that's all you can handle. But I will describe myself as the word, and God has always described himself as the word. That's why your Bible is so important. And if Steve could, could recommend to you 
uh, whether you're a believer or non-believer, just read your Bible, please. And he would tell you, probably recommend to you that you would start in the Gospel of John. Just if you're a friend of Steve's and maybe you're like Dan, you know, maybe he's invited you a time or two or 13 or three and a half years. And you're like, yeah, maybe someday. Uh, could you just read the Gospel of John? And you'll know what made Steve Hurd tick and um, what God was to him. So mercy, God uses, the, when God said, I, I'm going to describe myself to you. You know the first word that he used to describe himself? The very first word that God chose, and he made up words, so he can choose any word that he wants. He chose one, the very first word was merciful. And I don't know if that's the God that you've heard of. I bet if you go to this church, that's the God you've heard of. But Christianity in the church does a really poor job of, of representing God sometimes because he's a God of judgment. He's a God uh, of damnation. He's a God who sends people to hell. He's a God who um, condemns people for living a lifestyle like this or like that or the other. And that's certainly uh, not the God of the Bible and... Certainly not the God I'm sure Scott shares on a weekly basis. God of mercy, and mercy just simply means compassion that moves you to action. To have compassion is, oh, I'm sorry for you. Oh, I'm sorry about that. But mercy is having such compassion on someone that it moves you to do something. Think about a time when you were moved to do something out of compassion for someone. That's God. And every ounce of it, if you go back to the source, if, if mercy is a river, you go all the way back to the source, you know where the headwater of mercy is? It's God. Maybe you thought it was judgment or condemnation or religion. Oh, I gotta go to church all the time now. You know? No, if you go back, to the source of mercy, it's God. And he's, he was moved with compassion to the point of action on our behalf. Because of his great love. That's a noun. And in the Greek, it's ag we say agape. I'm not going to try and... Just, you know, it doesn't matter. So agape, his great agape. So he's just not merciful. He's rich in mercy. And he's just not loving. He's great at loving. But this word is a noun. So, he's, so he, it says his great love, because of his great love with which he loved us. It's the same word now, but it's now in a verb form. Ladies, let me ask you. Do you want your man to love you as a noun? Or do you want him to love you in the form of a verb? To love you. Right? Do you want him to just say, I love you, babe, and if I change my mind, I'll let you know? <laughs> no. You want him to manifest that love. Then show me. And that's what Bryce and others talked about Steve's life. It wasn't to get anything. It was to, to manifest. Because of his great love with which he loved us, even when we were dead in trespasses. Who's ever heard the term um, caught red-handed or dead-handed, right? Right? And the, the signs, you probably have some around Tucson, maybe in the outer, outer edges of Tucson. Shoot first, ask questions later, right? I, I just, I don't know, it just comes across that way to me. Uh, when we were dead in trespasses, that means we've done things that we knew were wrong. Anybody in here, you've never... You've never done anything that you knew was wrong? Anybody? I always check. I'd love to meet somebody. So we've all done things that we know were absolutely wrong. Wrong, wrong, wrong. We were dead in trespass. Made, he made us alive together with Christ. He made us. We're the, we're, we're the sub. This is called passive. We're, it happens to us. You know, the ball, baseball doesn't hit itself, or softball didn't hit itself. Steve hit the softball out of the park, you know, often. 
That's what God does for us. That's what Steve recognized. He's made us alive together with Christ, and then by grace you have been saved. This, if mercy is a bookend to hold the gospel, then the other bookend is grace. Mercy and grace. And they do the same thing. They hold us up and hold us together, but they're different too. If you look at one and the other, they look almost the same, but one is, is God, you know, we kind of use this slang. Mercy is God not giving us what we deserve. You know, what little boy, when you and I got caught stealing, Bryce, did you ever get caught stealing? Where are you, Bryce? Yeah. Corey, did Bryce ever get caught stealing? Three times. <laughs> did he confess and repent? No, the <laughs> mercy is not getting what we deserve. Grace is being a grandparent, right? You can't say a parent because sometimes you want to kill them. Uh, but grandparent, right? Who in here just can't help yourself buying something for your grandkids? Like all the time. You just can't help yourself. It, it just something comes over you, right? You just, ah! Uh, and then when they get in trouble at home, you, you, you know, you discipline your kids because they're disciplining your grandkids, right? You stop that. You know, mercy is not getting what we deserve and grace is getting what we, or mercy is getting what we don't deserve and grace is getting what we don't deserve. We don't have to earn it. We don't have to work for it. Can I just ask you a real, it, that's a horrible relationship and as a pastor for 20 some years, you know how many times in marriage counseling a wife and a husband will sit across the desk from me and just weeping or, or not saying anything. She's crying and he's just sitting there. And you just, your heart breaks. And you get to the bottom and, and, and she says, feel like I'm living on eggshells. I'm walking on eggshells all the time. All the time. If I do anything, if I say anything, if I'm out at the right place at the right time, all hell breaks loose in our home. You don't know that. Nobody else knows that. But it's happening in my home, and I can't, I can't take it anymore. Because it's, it's not a love-based relationship. It's a works-based relationship. And she has to work for his love. And a lot of us, we think that's God. We have to work for his love. We have to, we have to dress a certain way. We have to talk a certain way. We have to go to a certain church. We have to do certain ordinances and certain this and certain that. And it's not in the Bible. By grace, you're, you're getting a gift that you don't deserve because of his loving kindness to be saved. Now, somebody who needs to be saved, uh, any firemen in, in the room or former firemen, for, um, police, sir, thank you very much for your service. Um, police officers, anybody, police officers, law enforcement. In, you, know, you know, we're not talking about being saved like, a softball game being left on second base. Guys, that's not what we're talking about. We're not talking about a pitcher coming in and saving a game. You know, and what's your record of saves? How many saves? That's what we're talking about. This saved means saved from destruction or death. We're saved from destruction or death. And God so loved us noun form that he loved us and he sent his son because he's full of mercy because he doesn't want us to receive what we deserve but he wants to give us what we can't earn he wants to give it to us and can i tell you that religion will always try and make us work for what's free from god 
They'll try and get us to pay for it, what's free from God. And if they can't get us to work for it or to pay for it, then they convince us that we have to repay him for it. And if you read your Bible, as I've recommended the Gospel of John, it's all free. It's free mercy. It's free grace to us. It was not free to him. He raised us up together. This is all past tense, but it's future tense for you and I. But to God, there's no past, present, or future. Did you know that? That there is no past, present, or future. So for for Ev and for Corey and Bryce and the family and friends, you know, it's going to be days and weeks or however long till Jesus comes back. Everybody say this weekend, amen? Amen, amen. except for the last, you know, so we're waiting, but Steve's there now, and in the twinkling of an eye for Steve, we'll be with him. Ev will be with Jesus, number one, and with her husband, and with everybody else, because there is no. So this is all past tense, but it's, it's future for us. And made us sit together in the heavenly places in Christ Jesus, that in the ages to come... He might show the exceeding riches of his grace. So he's rich in mercy and he's, um, he's uh, um, exceedingly rich in grace. Well, now, isn't God just a terrible, demanding, control freak that you don't want to have anything to do with? Uh, let's see, he's, he's rich in mercy. He's not going to... Give me what I deserve. He's he's exceedingly rich in his grace. He wants to give me what I don't I don't earn. I can't earn. This God isn't such a bad guy, such a bad God. And in his kindness towards us in Christ Jesus, all of the gifts of God are wrapped up in the gift of Jesus Christ. It's just that simple. We were talking about it today when Paul, or yesterday when Paul um, tells the Thessalonians, because somebody comes in afterwards and screws up their understanding of theology, and uh, they're all worried that, you know, if they died or who died, and they miss, they're going to miss going to heaven. And he writes, he's like, hey, guys, I, I already taught you this, but I'm going to tell you to you again. And he goes through the order of, of what happened when somebody dies now, and, and if and when Jesus comes back and, and how we all get to heaven and we're always going to be in, in heaven and um, his great kindness towards us in Christ Jesus. It's all wrapped up in one amazing gift of Jesus. And the question is not do you want to become a Calvary Chapelite? Do you want to become a Lutheran or a Methodist or a Presbyterian or a whatever? It's not the question. The question is, do you want to receive the gift of mercy and grace? And it's all wrapped up in Jesus. So now you understand, for by grace, loving kindness, moving God to action that you and I can't earn, you have been saved, that means saved from death and destruction, through faith, not in yourself, not in a church, faith in Jesus Christ, and it's not of ourselves, it's a gift. Have you ever made your kid or your grandkid pay for their gifts? Anybody here? Sometimes that's a double-edged question, right? Have you ever made them pay you back? Have you ever made them work? It's a gift. It's a gift of God, not of works, lest anyone should boast. Now, there's two ways you can teach the Bible. You can teach theology, and then you usually tack on a story to help, just like Jesus did. He'd teach something, then he'd see looks that some of the looks I'm getting right now. So then he always went to a parable. I'm going to finish with just a really quick historical account. If you want to understand, like, what in the world is that crazy guy from St. George just talking about? Because I'm hungry, and I heard there's some snacks in the fellowship hall. You know, um, let me wrap it up. If you didn't get anything what I just said, then just listen to this. I'm just going to read this. It's in the Gospel of Luke, 
and it's uh, in uh, chapter 7. I don't know why I have it in chapter 2, but Luke chapter 7. It says, now when um, he concluded all his sayings in the hearing of people, that's Jesus, he entered Capernaum, which is his favorite city on the north shore of Galilee. It's one of the most beautiful places in Israel. It says that uh, a certain centurion, this is a Roman soldier who um, was known that he would rather die in place than give up an inch of ground to the enemy. That was his job. When all else fails, you stay there till you die. And you lead these hundred men to do the same. That's what we're counting. And so you don't get to be a centurion just by signing up. So it says that a certain centurion, a certain centurion's servant was dear to him and was sick and ready to die. Okay, so now we got, okay, salvation is coming in here somehow, right? So this Roman soldier who, do you know why the Roman soldiers were in Israel? To occupy them, okay? This is like to control them. This is, they were bad guys, okay? This is to us, um, you know, it was like maybe our troops in, in Afghanistan, you know? Uh, our guys and gals over there, seen by the Afghan people, most of them, you know, at first, especially, uh, bad guys. The bad guys are, are here, and they're taking our, our uh, holding us captive or whatever. So when he heard about Jesus, he sent elders to the Jews to come to him, pleading with him to come and heal his servant. And when they came to Jesus, they begged him earnestly, saying that the one whom he should do this was deserving. So this Roman centurion, his servant is sick, and we want you to come and heal his servant. His servant, And because this Roman centurion, he deserves it. And now they're going to say, why? For he loves our nation. That's kind of a weird for a Roman centurion, for them, for Jewish people to say he loves our nation. And secondly, he has built us a synagogue. Well, in some religions, the more you do, you know, the, the closer to the front you get. You know, and they're like, hey, you need... This, is, this guy's done everything. He's built us a sanctuary. He's built us a place of worship. He deserves you to go do this for him, Jesus. And then Jesus went with them, and, and when he was already not far from the house, the centurion sent friends to him saying, Lord, here's this powerful, powerful Roman soldier sending a message to Jesus, this Jewish rabbi, renegade rabbi. He sends, and the first word he says is Lord. There's not a very many, probably count of five, five fingers how many people this man called Lord. It would have been his commanding officer and his commanding officer and up to Caesar. That's the only buddy he's calling Lord. He says, Lord, do not trouble yourselves, for I am not worthy that you should enter under my roof. He had a proper perspective of himself. And, you know, if you said, Steve, you're a work man, you, you served and you helped start Planet Church, you did so much at Calvary St. George, you were a big part of just the fellowship, heart of fellowship here. Oh, Steve, you deserve. He'd be like, whoa, whoa, stop the train. I am not worthy of any. Jesus is the only one who is worthy. So then... It says, therefore, I did not even think myself worthy to come to you, but say the word and my servant will be healed. For I also am a man placed under authority, having soldiers under me. And I say to, to one, go, and he goes, and another, come, and he comes. And to my servant, do this, and he does it. And when Jesus heard these things, he marveled at him, and he turned around, and he said to the crowd that followed him, he said, I say to you, I have not found such great faith not even in Israel. What did we say? What's Steve's favorite verse in the front of your bulletin? Look at it. Look at it. For by grace, that's God's loving action to you. That you and I can't. For by grace, you have been saved from death, destruction, through faith. And Jesus just says, I have not seen such great faith, not even in Israel. 
And those who were sent returning home found the servant well who had been sick. What did the servant do to get, get healed? Nothing. What did the Roman soldier do to have his servant be healed by Jesus? Just asked him. Just asked. I'm going to pray. Will you please strip away every form of religiosity that you've ever experienced? And if the church, quote unquote, has hurt you, just manifested hypocrisy to you, that's not Jesus or God, that's, that's me and Steve and others. Because this is God. And this is Jesus. And if you would love to be healed, to be saved, and to be in heaven where there's no more pain, no more suffering, no more tears, no more death, then put your faith. If I was in Las Vegas, I'd say put it all on red. The blood of Jesus. And you won't go wrong. Let me pray. God. Uh, thank you. Thank you for this celebration of life. This life, in our terms, Steve's bios, his, bi his biological life ended last Saturday. But Lord, because he put his faith in you, and by your grace, he was saved through that faith, not of any of the works that he did in any of the churches or for anything else, but simply faith in you. Lord, he has another kind of life, a Zoe life, a life that extends past the last breath that he took. And if you just bow your heads and close your eyes, this has nothing to do with anybody else besides you. And if Steve was in here in person, he probably wouldn't be up here behind this microphone. He'd say, Rick, will you go share the gospel with them? I'm like, you do it. You're better. He would ask you to put your faith in Jesus. Get rid of all the religious stuff and just ask yourself, do you want to be forgiven of your sins? Do you want to be saved from death? Spiritual death. Retaining your own sins, they'll take you to exactly where they took Jesus when he bore our sins, to hell. And only Jesus could conquer sin and death. And he defeated them and Satan and he rose on the third day and he said, if you believe in me, you will live forever. If you've never prayed, I'm not asking you how many times you've gone to church. I'm not telling you how good you are. I'm not telling, asking you how many years you've tithed or how little you've tithed or if you've never gone to church. It doesn't matter at this point. It matters right now. Do you want to be saved? Do you want to be saved by grace through faith in Jesus who conquered sin and death, which you cannot do? I can't do. Pastor Scott can't do. Calvary Chapel can't do. And no religion can do for you because none of us rose from the dead, just Jesus. I want to pray with you. And I'm not ashamed to pray it in front of everybody, but please don't be looking around and just keep, if you want to pray and believe in Jesus and have your eternity changed, just receive the gift of Jesus. We just raise your hand and say, that I, I, I want to. I, I thought I was coming to a memorial service for my buddy today, but today I want to put my faith in what he believed. I want to believe in Jesus. I want to be saved from my sin. I know I'm a sinner. I know that. When I do things wrong, I have to ask for forgiveness or I'm not forgiven. Would you consider 
being saved for eternity. Go be with Jesus and have the blessed assurance that Steve is living now. Just raise your hand. I want to pray with you. I'm going to pray it out loud. You don't have to. Is there anybody at all? If you didn't raise your hand, if you did, just pray this prayer. God, forgive me. Forgive me for the sins that I have committed that I will commit. Forgive me for the sins that I commit that I don't even know. And today I ask that you would save me by grace. Your loving kindness that moved you to action. That I would receive the mercy of God through Jesus Christ. I won't receive what I deserve. And that you would wash me of my sins and cleanse me of my unrighteousness. And I ask you to become the Lord of my life and help me walk. And when I don't, when I fall, forgive me when I confess and lead me in your everlasting way. I ask and pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. So now I think, Bo, or you're going to know you're doing a song that Steve requested, and then Bo will come up. Who brings the power of sin and darkness? Whose love is mighty and so much stronger than the King of the Lord? The King above all kings Who shakes the whole With holy fire Who leaves us breathless In awe and wonder The King of glory The King above all kings This is amazing grace This is amazing
done for me. Let's praise him together. Hey, on behalf of the family, just want to thank you all for being here. Super awesome to see so many people here for Steve and Ev, and it's just absolutely a blessing. Now, the family uh, would love for you to join them in the fellowship hall for some refreshments right now. So that's just immediately in the big room right over there. So God bless you guys. Thank you so much for coming out.